Monsters. Hello and welcome to Immortal Monsters, the podcast shedding candlelight on cryptids, hauntings, mythology, and more. This is your host, Lee Donna, and today's epic tale of biblical proportions has history, archaeological finds, modern day thievery, giants, demons, wild men, and a healthy dose of my own personal sarcasm. To get to the good stuff, though, we must first travel all the way back to a time in human history commonly referred to as the early dynastic period. This period stretched from 2900 to 2350 BC. When we are dealing with the BC end of the timeline, the larger number, in this case 2900, is the oldest date, and the smaller number is the most recent. So the BC date is growing larger as we count back in history, which is the exact opposite of how things work on our side of the timeline. I'm putting this in for my son because he officially started college when he was 16, And he came home one day so irritated because he was the youngest person in his math class, but the one the instructor kept tasking with helping everyone else in the class out. Sometimes this instructor would ditch class entirely and leave my son in charge, which he did not mind to help. But on this particular day, he said the instructor went over the number line. And that's basically where class ended because he said that the number line absolutely blew people's minds. They could not grasp the negative end. What in our story today would be the BC end. And I guess the instructor just got fed up and left the 16 year old in in charge, um, told him, you try to explain it. So every time I see a number line association, it makes me laugh, which is what I did when my poor kid came home angry and complaining. I mean, he's a really good storyteller, even when he's upset. So I mean, he had sound effects and everything, and I am clearly a terrible mother who has no sympathy whatsoever for his plight because 11 years later, every time I think about this, it still makes me laugh. So that's why I'm putting that in there, not to patronize you guys, but just because that is a funny story, and I'm always reminded of that. But the early dynastic period, which we will forevermore call the ED period, is no laughing matter. This time frame depicts the archaeological culture of ancient Mesopotamia, an area that included Babylonia and Assyria, and that now encompasses modern day Iraq or Iraq, depending on where you're from and how you like to pronounce your words. It was during this ED time in human history that technological advances were leading to the formation of urban civilizations and different forms of writing were emerging. Some of these writings in the form of seals and clay tablets list the names of cities and rulers and suggest that there was a league of Sumerian city-states. Two of the earliest of these city-states Eridu and Uruk contained large temple complexes built of bricks of mud. These temples became the most imposing structures in the cities, with the town and villages springing up around the temples, which is very common design that we see throughout history. Each temple was dedicated to its own deity, and each city had at least one major deity. These urban areas, as cities tend to do, grew considerably in size during the ED period, and recent archaeological finds are proving that these cities were much more developed than modern man would like to give our ancestors credit for. Substantial architecture was taking place, the building of palaces, temples, and monumental tombs. There is also evidence for the existence of a rich and powerful local elite. In Lower Mesopotamia, we find the influential and powerful Sumerian city of Uruk, with other powerful cities stretching out to the north and the west, cities such as Kish. Uruk, being one of the largest cities, is estimated to have had a population of 50,000 to 80,000 at its peak. 
in all of these Sumerian cities combined, the rough estimate of a population is thought to be somewhere between 800,000 and 1.5 million, with the global human population at that time estimated to have been about 27 million. Of course, where there are people, there is war. And in the archaeological evidence, there is not only accounts of war, but also of peace treaties. However, it is said that during the ED period, the rulers were less concerned about war and peace and more interested in glorifying their pious acts, which is why they were constructing and restoring temples and organizing offerings to the gods. These pious rulers were those of the Sumerian city-states such as Uruk, where in the early part of the Ed period, a king named Gilgamesh reigned. Poems were written about him and tells of his legendary feats earned him such praise that the man turned into myth. By the later part of the Ed period, he was being worshipped as a god by other kings and peoples in Mesopotamia and beyond. In 1849 AD, this side of our timeline, 12 clay tablets were discovered by archaeologist Austin Henry Laylord. He was in the ancient city of Nineveh in northern Iraq, seeking evidence to confirm the historical accuracy of the Hebrew Bible. Instead, he unearthed one of the oldest historical libraries and found ancient texts that are much, much older than the Bible. In this library of Ashurbanipal, that's my best way that I'm ever going to pronounce that, um, but in this library there were found these 12 clay tablets to the chagrin of Christian leaders everywhere, these clay tablets held many of the same stories that are found in the Bible. This is a problem because they predate the time when the advertised divine events of the Old Testament were supposed to have taken place. And the people who are said to have done these things don't belong to the right side of the evil versus good storyline set out in the Bible. It's almost as if people who later conquered ancient Mesopotamia took the stories of the people in that area and made them their own, saying it was their God and their prophets who did or lived these events. You know, rewriting history to serve their own ends, which honestly isn't surprising. Narrative changes are not anything novel. We see them all the time throughout history and mythology, one big example is the way Christmas was hijacked and turned into a Christian holiday simply because the new leaders could not stop the people from celebrating at that time of the year, so they rebranded the celebration to fit their own narrative. Before you get mad at me, let me be clear. I do not care what you believe. Without a doubt, the core of every belief we have is rooted in both ignorance and truth. And while facts are facts, you can choose to ignore them to your heart's content. As long as you are not harming other people, we are good. I say this because the bulk of people in any religion are there for the right reasons. They want to do good and they want to be good. Unfortunately, though, not only throughout our history, but even now in our current world, fear is used to force all manner of belief structures on the masses, and it's usually done in a way that makes those being manipulated feel virtuous, which is why I love archaeology. Ancient sites are continually being discovered, and they are turning what we thought we knew upside down ironically proving that there really is nothing new under the sun. People have always been the same, regurgitating the same stories and behaviors, and as we trace ideologies back through time, the manipulation becomes glaringly obvious. So again, I do not care what you believe. All I'm saying is sip and spit. Taste that Kool-Aid, but don't swallow the whole jug. The 12 clay tablets that were unearthed at Nineveh in 1849 
are now known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. This epic amalgamation of stories describes Gilgamesh as being two-thirds divine and one-third mortal. In this body of work, we not only find stories akin to the Garden of Eden and Noah's Ark, we also find the framework for later sagas and heroic traditions. We're talking Homer and the Iliad because Gilgamesh, the legendary king who surpasses all other kings, is himself the prototype for the likes of demigods such as Hercules. Gilgamesh, the man, the myth, the legend, is the source for five Sumerian poems, which predate the 12 clay tablets known as the Akkadian Epic of Gilgamesh. These poems are repeated in some form within the 12 clay tablets, and in addition to these works, we also have artifacts that span across a 2,000-year time frame that mention Gilgamesh's existence. The Sumerian king list consists of a succession of royal dynasties from different Sumerian cities, ranging all the way back to the E.D. period. It was used by later Mesopotamian kings to legitimize their rule, and today some of the information on the list can be checked against other texts, such as economic documents. King Enme Baragizi is one whose name is found on the Sumerian king list. He led the Sumerians into battle around 2700 BC, defeating the Elamites. His existence is corroborated by archaeological records and artifacts, and he's also listed as the father of one of Gilgamesh's adversaries named Aga. One of the five original Sumerian poems is titled Gilgamesh and Aga, and it records Aga's siege of Uruk after Gilgamesh refuses to submit to Aga's authority. In the end, Gilgamesh defeats Aga. So while we are still discovering new artifacts which help to piece together the true history of our planet and the people who lived here before us, Gilgamesh's name appears over and over, and his likeness is found on clay plaques and seals, such as the seal of Masinopita, a king of Kish, which was excavated from the royal cemetery at Ur and dates back to around 2600 BC. The seal shows Gilgamesh with a bull and two lions, animals that tie in with the poems written about his adventures. This seal also shows another man who is thought to be Gilgamesh's enemy turned best friend in Kidu. There is also an inscription that some scholars believe might have belonged to an official under Gilgamesh. It was discovered in the archaic text of Ur, and Gilgamesh's name is written as Gilgamesh, the one whom Utu has selected, Utu being the sun god, also known as Shamas or Samas. In a 34-line text dating back to 1953 to 1920 BC, Gilgamesh is credited as being the ruler who built the walls of Uruk. King Utu Hingal, who later ruled Uruk, adopted Gilgamesh as his patron deity. Kings from the third dynasty of Ur from around 2112 to 2004 BC went so far as to call Gilgamesh their divine brother and friend with King Shulgai of Ur, who ruled between 2029 and 1982 BC, declaring himself the actual brother of Gilgamesh, declaring they had the same divine parents. So basically, King Shulgai wanted to be seen as two-thirds divine and one part mortal himself. Interestingly, in our more modern era, Saddam Hussein, the former president of Iraq, had a lifelong fascination with Gilgamesh. In 2000 AD, he published his first fiction novel. It was set in ancient Assyria and blended ele elements of the Epic of Gilgamesh with the 1001 Nights. 
in 2003, when the United States tried to pressure Saddam to step down, Saddam gave a speech to a group of his generals in which he compared himself to the epic hero Gilgamesh. Going back to ancient Mesopotamia, archaeologists have found prayers inscribed in clay tablets addressing Gilgamesh as a judge of the dead in the underworld. And fragments of a text found in modern day Tel Hadad say that the people of Uruk or Uruk diverted the flow of the river Euphrates and buried their unfortunately mortal and beloved King Gilgamesh in the riverbed after which the parted waters were allowed to flow in their natural state once again. Because of all of this evidence, most people do believe Gilgamesh was in fact a real person. I believe that with the recent discoveries, there will only be more evidence to support his existence. Now, that does not mean that all of the stories told about him are true. The original five poems are less fanciful than what comes later in the 12 clay tablets, and I read in one source that those original five poems were thought to be a result of Gilgamesh himself telling his life story to a scribe who wrote it all down word for word. Whether this is true or not, the legendary king Gilgamesh went through considerable growth as a person during the time of his reign. He went from protector of his people to oppressor and then rose to the rank of an ancient wise man before being turned into a deity. On the fragment of a retelling of the Epic of Gilgamesh that dates back to between 600 BC and 100 BC, this is thousands of years after Gilgamesh lived, there is an inscription that reads, he who saw all, who was the foundation of the land, who knew everything, was wise in all matters. Gilgamesh. This kind of gives me King Solomon vibes, if you guys are familiar with the stories from the Bible. So while the Epic of Gilgamesh may or may not truthfully narrate the various exploits of Gilgamesh, the Epic is certainly fascinating. I'm now going to run through some of the highlights of Gilgamesh's heroic and harrowing life without rolling my eyes too much. In those distant days, those remote nights of distant years, in the days of yore, when the necessary things had been brought into existence and for the first time properly cared for, when the heavens had been separated from the earth and the earth from the heavens, when the ovens of the land had been made to work and bread had been tasted for the first time in the shrines of the earth, in those distant days when the fame of one man had been established, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, did reign. He was wise, physically stronger than all others, handsome, cunning. He was adventurous, courageous, strong of heart, all the things a good hero is made of. He was unmatched in every single area of his life, and was beloved as a protector and a king. Until, as we say here in the South, he started to get a little too big for his britches. Gilgamesh, being so superior to everyone around him, fell to the corruption of the power he held over the people. He turned into a massive bully, not to mention a horrible terrible, despicable, evil person. He started challenging all the men to battle him. They'd wrestle and fight, have foot races, and do all manner of things to test their physical strength. Not because they wanted to, because he made them, and none of them could stand against Gilgamesh. When they would fail or pass out, he would force them to get up and try again, force them just to keep going. The same was true of gambling or anything else that could possibly be turned into a competition. Gilgamesh would outwit, outlast, and utterly dominate. He even enslaved the young men, wearing them out with forced labor on all of the building projects he was doing at the time. 
He's credited with a lot of building and infrastructure. And in the end, those things were mostly good, providing irrigation and safety for the people. But Gilgamesh got to those ends by being cruel. He ruled with fear and it worked because people were terrified of him. He would take any woman he wanted and do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, with or without her consent. He even went so far as to take new brides away from their husbands so Gilgamesh would be the one to consummate the marriage and not the husband. Because this pig-headed brute with no one capable of checking him believed that all of the women of Uruk belonged to the king, not to their husbands, and certainly not to themselves. Gilgamesh was brutal, and despite having once revered their king, his oppressed people now began to cry out to the gods for help. Anu, the god of the sky, took clay from the earth and molded a man meant to be an equal to Gilgamesh. He then threw this clay into the wilderness, and this clay became the wild man and Kidu. And Kidu was primitive, covered in hair, and he lived with the animals as one of them, the same way Tarzan did. The wilderness was in Kidu's kingdom, and just as Gilgamesh was once the protector of Uruk, and Kidu protected the animals of his kingdom. One day, a trapper spotted Enkidu tearing up the snares he'd set to capture the animals. His livelihood in danger, the trapper prayed to the sun god Shamash. Now, it was either the sun god or Gilgamesh himself who arranged a ploy to get Enkidu out of the wilderness, tamed and integrated into society. While it's written both ways, the means by which Enkidu becomes a civilized man is the same, whether it was orchestrated by Gilgamesh or the sun god. Enkidu is seduced by a woman. This woman is called a temple prostitute whose name is Shamat. And in other texts, she's called the temple priestess named Shamkatam. Sex in the temples was a big thing back then, and from the dirty deeds we know about today, I'd say not much has changed. If you'd like to pretend otherwise, just steer clear of all true crime. But I am going to say that Shamat or Shamkatam represents the same person. She was probably dubbed as a priestess, and part of her job description included sex work. Poor Enkidu did not know, and he did not care. The temptress walked into his forest, removed her clothing, and this beast of a man took one look and fell head over heels in such a frenzy of lust that he ravaged the priestess for six days and seven nights. While this was a glorious time for Enkidu, having this experienced priestess teaching him the art of lovemaking, by the end of his second week with her, he found out that everything has a cost. The animals Enkidu had lived with and cared for as his family no longer wanted anything to do with him. He was no longer one of them. He was now a man. And while Enkidu didn't yet fully understand the meaning of that, he accepted that he was no longer welcome in the kingdom he lived in his whole life. Like poor old Adam eating the forbidden fruit, Enkidu was kicked out of the wilderness. But as Eve did not abandon Adam, neither did the lovely and skilled Shemot abandon her new lover. She led Enkidu from the wilderness and into a shepherd's camp. There he learned from the shepherds, became a night watchman for their flocks, got himself some clothes because now among civilized people being naked was not acceptable. Meanwhile, King Gilgamesh was having bad dreams. When he closed his eyes, he saw disturbing things like an axe falling from the sky. He went to his mother, the goddess Ninsen. She told him not to worry that the dreams were not bad omens. They instead signified that a companion for Gilgamesh would soon arrive in Uruk. And arrive, Enkidu did. 
But first, let's jump to this side of the timeline and talk about Hobby Lobby. The Gilgamesh dream tablet, where the story of him having these bad dreams and seeking counsel from his mother is recorded, was stolen and illegally imported into the United States in the early 2000s. The tablet was encrusted with dirt and unreadable when it was purchased by a U.S. antiquities dealer in 2003. In 2007, the tablet was sold again by this unnamed antiquities dealer who included a letter falsely stating that the tablet had been inside a box of ancient bronze fragments purchased in a 1981 auction. Then seven years later in 2014, Hobby Lobby privately purchased the tablet for display at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. There was some drama when this tablet went on display, and in 2019, the Gilgamesh dream tablet was seized by U.S. officials, but it still wasn't returned to Iraq until September of 2021. While Enkidu was in the shepherd's camp learning to be a civilized man since he couldn't go back to his home after that blasted woman tempted him and he just could not help himself but to partake of what she offered, Enkidu was hearing stories about the cruelty of King Gilgamesh. The shepherds acknowledged that Enkidu was strong and powerful and that he'd make an excellent warrior. But they cautioned him against challenging the king, for no man had ever stood up to Gilgamesh and won. But Enkidu, full of the bread and beer that his temptress was still offering him, you know, doing her part to tame the wild man and introduce him to all of the things that men love, Enkidu decided that he was going to the city and that he was going to put a stop to Gilgamesh once and for all. So Enkidu travels to Uruk and blocks the door of a wedding chamber that Gilgamesh is trying to enter. The king laughs and tells Enkidu to move, that he has his lordly duties to perform with the new bride, and Enkidu refuses to move and instead challenges Gilgamesh to a test of strength. They wrestle and fight, and after a long and fierce battle, Enkidu acknowledges Gilgamesh's superior strength, and Gilgamesh prevails. But the king is so impressed by Enkidu's strength and tenacity that he tells Enkidu to be proud because no one else has ever lasted that long against him. And now Gilgamesh has a man friend who is very nearly his equal. The two men become thick as thieves. However, the original Sumerian poem does say that Enkidu becomes Gilgamesh's loyal and faithful servant, not an equal. So Enkidu is basically the right hand of the king, and it's very clear from the poems that these two men loved each other dearly. In fact, one day, for an unknown reason, Enkidu was very sad. In order to cheer him up, Gilgamesh proposes a journey to the legendary forest of cedar. He says that they'll go on this fun little trip, cut down some of the sacred cedar trees, and slay the guardian, the monstrous demigod Humbaba the Terrible, also known as Huwawa the Giant. And Kido says, no way. Have you seen the size of the giant? No one can defeat him. He's not going to let us take his trees. This is a suicide mission. I am not going. But Gilgamesh pats Enkidu on the back and tells him not to be afraid. They'll gain fame and renown from this little adventure. And you know what? Even if they die in battle, it's an honorable way to go. So everything is going to be just fine. And Kidu isn't convinced, but he begins to go along with this plot anyway. And Gilgamesh calls for his advisors. He tells them what he and his buddy plan to do. And they aren't fond of this plan either. They try to talk some sense into Gilgamesh, but by this point, the man is too far gone for reason. So the advisors cave and tell their king to do as he pleases. So happy now that he has 
their forced blessing, Gilgamesh goes and he asks his god Shamash for protection, after which he arms himself and Kidu and 50 other men. Together, they make the six-day journey to the cedar forest. Along the way, Gilgamesh once again has bad dreams, and he begins to doubt himself, even suggesting they call off this foolhardy mission. Enkidu, however, interprets these dreams not as bad omens and insists that since they've come this far, they might as well see their glory-seeking mission through. In one of the sweetest scenes from any heroic epic ever, Enkidu slips his hand into that of his king and the two warriors enter the sacred forest hand in hand. Battle ensues and Gilgamesh, being clever, is able to trick the guardian of the forest, ending the giant's life and decimating the once sacred forest. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to the next really sweet part of the story because slaying the giant was Gilgamesh's way to cheer up his friends. And later, Enkidu has an opportunity to do the same thing for his beloved king. In these days of love and adoration, there was a single hallowed tree growing along the bank of the mighty Euphrates River. Wikipedia tells me this tree is most likely a St. Lucie cherry tree, which was cultivated for a spice that was made from the stone inside the cherry fruit. It's also a nice hard wood, which is great for building and carving things. So this tree is minding its own business and growing up when along comes a great storm, one with strong winds that rained hailstones down upon the earth. These small hailstones were like hammers, but the larger ones were like the kind of boulders that were shot from catapults. Inky, the god of water, was sailing for the netherworld when the storm blew in, making the waters swell until the kill of Inky's little boat was trembling as if it were being butted by turtles. A really great visual, and one Inky was less happy about than I am, because if his trembling boat wasn't enough, soon the waves were crashing over the bow of the boat, rising up to devour him like wolves. Then waves crashed over the stern of the boat, attacking him as if a lion. During this downpour, the poor cherry tree had its branches stripped away, all of its fine leaves gone. As it stood there bare on the riverbank, the wind picked up and the force of the south wind pulled the poor tree out of the ground, completely uprooting it. Left at the mercy of the overflowing Euphrates, the destitute old tree was picked up by the river that once watered it and was carried away. Inanna, a goddess akin to Aphrodite, went walking along the banks of the river. She saw the tree and being a good steward, she brought it home with her, planting the tree in her luxurious garden using only her feet, not her hands. When she watered the tree, she used only her feet, not her hands. Sorry, my dog just jumped or barked and she made me jump. It's really hot in this room, so I can't close this door. Um, so I'm sorry if you hear her barking. Okay, so Inanna planted the tree with her feet, not her hands. She watered it with her feet, not her hands. And she cared for the tree in the same way for over a decade, waiting for the day when it could be used to make her a throne or a bed. Under her devoted care, the tree grew massive, so big that a snake immune to incantations made a nest in the roots. Then a lion-headed eagle known as the Anzud bird made a nest in the branches with its young, and in the trunk, which apparently never split, a phantom maid who laughed with a joyful heart made herself a home. This phantom maid was the Kisikililaki, later known as Lilith. 
which is really the entire reason I looked into Gilgamesh. I'll be doing an episode on Lilith soon because she's a vampire. Yep, you heard me. But for now, back to Inanna having an issue with the happy, joyful-hearted, blood-sucking phantom living in her tree. This woman made the goddess uncomfortable. Clearly, Inanna wasn't one to support other women, so she went crying to her brother about the happy lady in her tree. But her brother told her, no thanks, I don't want to get involved. She, He said that Inanna was being silly and jealous, and he did not want anything to do with that tree. Besides, she had plenty of chairs and other furniture, and the critters living in the tree were just fine. They're happy. Leave them alone. Well, this really ticked the goddess off, so she went to the one man she knew would not let her down, the warrior Gilgamesh, who in this text is also referred to as her brother. Gilgamesh, loving the attention of getting to be the hero, strapped on a weighted belt. Now, I think he probably loaded this belt down with weapons, but the text reads as if it was full of money. So who knows? Maybe he thought Lilith was pretty and for hire. All I know for sure is that he did have at least one weapon with him. He had a bronze axe. He took this axe and killed the snake. The Anzid bird, watching this happen and knowing it would be next, took its young and flew up into the mountains. The happy phantom maiden slipped silently away and hid in the wilderness because she likes blood, not coins. So Gilgamesh then uproots this poor tree once more and strips it of its beautiful branches, giving what's left of the tree to his companions who then chop up the pieces and carve the wood into a bed and a throne, which they give to Inanna. In the original Sumerian poem, it says that for himself, Gilgamesh made two items, one fashioned from the root of the tree and one from the branches. In the later Akkadian version, the 12 tablets, it is said that as a reward for his heroism, Inanna fashioned two gifts for Gilgamesh. Either way, these gifts were a piku and a miku, which no one knows the translation of. Some say it's a ball and a stick. Others suggest that it's a drum and a drumstick. Whatever may be the case, it's very distinctly recorded that Gilgamesh absolutely adored his new toys. He played and played with his gifts, bragging and boasting in the streets, making other people join in until they were crying out that their hips and their backs were hurting. Gilgamesh didn't care. He made them stay in the streets, playing with him, to the point that the mothers and the sisters and the wives were bringing food and water to the people so they could be nourished because Gilgamesh was not letting anyone leave for any reason. He wanted to play and therefore the people played. Finally, though, Gilgamesh is ready to call it a night and he marks a spot on the ground where his ball or his drum had last been and he leaves. The next day, his new toys are gone. Somehow they are now in the underworld. The poem says he tried to reach them with his hands and with his feet, but he couldn't. So he sat on the ground at the gates of the underworld and wept, crying for his toys and claiming it was those women who'd been complaining the night before that made his toys get taken away. I mean, Seriously, women are so whiny, wanting their husbands and their sons to come home and eat dinner, expecting them to get a good night of sleep. Completely unnecessary, ladies. And Enkidu knew it. After all, he'd already been tricked by one woman. And now here, his beloved king's toys are in the underworld because of the complaints of yet more women. It's a real shame. So Enkidu sympathized as his friend sat crying at the gates of the netherworld 
Gilgamesh weeping because the fun of his new toy had still been fresh for him. He wasn't yet bored. So he just would give anything to have his toys back so he could play with them until he didn't want them anymore. He said if those toys could just be waiting for him at home, that he'd go there and treat them so good. He'd care for these toys as if they were his own mother or his own sister. Considering how women are treated in the rest of the epic, I'm not so sure these toys wouldn't end up right back in the underworld, but our sympathetic Enkidu offers to go into the land of death anyway, because Gilgamesh is crying out for someone to please help him, and Enkidu is not going to let his best friend suffer any longer. Enkidu told Gilgamesh to turn his frown upside down for today. He, the once wild man of the forest, would retrieve the king's toys. Gilgamesh was elated. He gave Enkidu a bunch of rules. Things one should not do in the underworld, like throw sticks at the spirits there or slap his wife. But alas, Enkidu couldn't help himself. That blasted woman was aggravating the snot out of him, even while dead, so he smacked her. He then threw sticks at the people, and he even slapped his son because that was another spirit getting on his last nerve. Well, guess what happens when you break rules in the underworld? You get trapped there. So now poor, misunderstood, it's not his fault he's better than everyone else, Gilgamesh is crying for a whole new reason. He beseeched the gods for help and Inky, the one who was having problems in the storm that uprooted the cherry tree, took pity on the king and sent the young warrior Utu, who is another interesting, potentially real life hero, of those days, he sent this young warrior to open a hole in the netherworld. Utu did as instructed, and he saved Enkidu, bringing the man back to Gilgamesh, where the two best friends hugged and kissed and wore each other out with questions. Those questions and the rest of the tall and potentially real tales of Gilgamesh are stories for another day. Yes, I am being a bit cheeky with all of this, but as a woman, it's hard to read these things and not see the misogyny. Um, I also read them and get mad at my husband. It's the same as like when I have a bad dream and he gets in trouble for what he did in my dream. He's not technically responsible, but it still like gets that ire stoked a little bit. But um, I do recommend you look up the Epic of Gilgamesh and especially the translations of those first five original poems. The texts are damaged, so there are some missing words and sections, and conjecture is used to fill in the blanks with most of the translations. But you can see where parts of the work are probably real accounts versus fanciful embellishments. And most of the stories really are about how great Gilgamesh was and his heroics versus the cruel part of his person that I chose to exploit today. And one of those stories is a near word-for-word replica of the Noah's Ark story in the Bible, which is pretty cool to read. But um, reading any of these ancient texts lets you see where all sorts of stories, both in myth, myth and religion, come from. And there are texts older than the ones we talked about today that you can also trace ideologies back to. So all sarcasm aside, I really do find this stuff fascinating, and I hope that you guys do too. As it says in the NIV version of the Bible, which is also a quote found in literature from the ED period, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again, there is nothing new under the sun. So while you are busy being unoriginal, take a second to like, subscribe, share, and follow. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and X under some form of Lidana. My email is leadonabooks at gmail.com. I do love hearing from you guys and I do read all of the emails. 
Sometimes I forget to respond because I might read a message on my phone, but I hate doing anything off of my phone. So I don't respond right away. Then I forget to reply when I'm at my laptop and then I just forget altogether. So if you hit me up on social media, do so knowing that it's not you, it's me. I'm not intentionally ignoring you. I just get really irritated and toss my phone because tiny screens and then sometimes I click the wrong button and then I panic and I don't know how to fix whatever it was that I just did. I was recently trying to um, look at somebody's profile and I'm pretty sure that I blocked them instead. And I literally just chucked my phone and then I didn't turn it on again for two days. It is a real issue. The other really big issue that I'm having right now is there's this really gross line in the original Sumerian poem where Gilgamesh is telling Enkidu what not to do in the underworld. And Gilgamesh is describing this woman who lives in the netherworld telling Enkidu to stay away from her. And he says that she has fingers like a pickaxe and she plucks her hair out like leeks. That seriously makes my stomach roll every time I think about it. It's so, so gross. Ladies, do not pluck your hair out, especially if you have pickaxe fingers and huge roots. I really can't even joke about it because it just makes me want to retch. Um, it's the stuff of nightmares, much like my latest book. If you like psychological thrillers, check out Sierra. It's available worldwide and readers are absolutely loving it. LeeDonnaBooks.com to buy directly for me or grab it from the retailer of your choice. Thank you. I appreciate you. And I will see you next month with another vampire tale because they are so much more fun than everything else. I think I'm going to rebrand the show as that podcast about vampires. You know you want it as much as I do. Thank you guys. I truly appreciate you. I will see you next month. Bye. Monsters.